السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Hello everyone. This is the first session uh, in our revision uh, course. And we are going to start with the anatomy, inshallah. I was just telling my dear candidates that the more questions you are answering, the more confident you are in part one. Not in only in part one, in all parts, uh, to, be, to be honest. But in part one specifically, as, uh, as I'm always mentioning, don't swim in the ocean of basic knowledge. It's an ocean. And you are going to waste your, your whole life reading and reading and reading, and it's not going to lead you anywhere. Why? Because the questions are very specific on some point that you may miss. You may have never read about it. L let me tell you very, very clear. Some questions in part one exam, and it's written in the uh, in the bank, uh, the college bank of questions that they use for the exam. The examiner, when they write a question, they are going to take some questions from this bank and he is going to make a new question. Those new questions are based on what? They are based on the guidelines, talk article, scientific impact paper, um, Patient information leaflets sometimes, okay? Some basic knowledge from the NHS website that is known by heart for, for every uh, trainee there. So those are something that overseas candidates may miss. Why? Because they don't know what scientific impact papers are. They don't know what talk articles are. They know nothing. They just know that there is a, a green top guideline and um, that's it we just know that a nice guideline for, for some topics but let me tell you we, we have seen some pathology questions from the talk articles we have seen some pharmacology questions from scientific impact papers and, and I guess it's fair because the examiner need to have a proof for his question and his answer he cannot make the question and the answer from his mind. He should give them an explanation from a college resource, any, any resource. Th this is not from my uh, imagination. This is a rule. This is a legal rule. Why? Because once upon a time, there was a question from uh, a resource out of the, the college resources. And one of the uh, uh, candidates got a case against the college and he won it. Why? Because he thinks that his answer was right. And the examiner is saying, but also my answer is right. So which resource you have depended on? Uh, whatever, so and so. The candidate said, and also my answer is right. If, if you rely on... Uh, this resource so since since this incident and the college have paid a lot of money to this candidate since this incident it's a rule that the examiners should provide explanation for the question from a college resource authenticated resource so this is what we are doing now we are depending on the college resources and this is why I'm telling you, the more questions you are answering, that means that you have covered every other way the examiner could bring a question from. Okay, guys, let, let's start our mock. And hopefully, I, I want you to be cooperative as much as you can. Even if the answer is wrong, it's okay. Just tell me what's going on in, on, in your head so we can... Uh, let's say, fix any misunderstanding or misconcept. Today, we are going to revise the anatomy. Hopefully, we are going to cover as much as we can. And the rest, I'm going to send you the question to the group. Okay? Those questions are another level. That means after you, you are done with the question bank and you are done with the recalls, okay? The third resource for you is our group. Those questions are the utmost level. 
So if you are done with those questions, that means that you are perfect for the exam, inshallah. Those picture-based questions are very, very common in, in your exam. For some years, they, uh, they tend to bring um, a picture like this. And they are going to point on a muscle or an artery or whatever and have a question on it. So do you have any idea what is the nerve supply of the muscle in green? Do you have any idea what, what the muscle in, in, in green is called? Okay, this is indirect question. So, of course, you need to know the muscle first. Then you are going to know the nerve supply of this muscle or the arterial supply of this muscle. The one in green here, yes, excellent. It's the anterior remive spinal nerves from L1 to L3. Okay, so let's see the other one. The other one in green now. All our questions today are based on recalls, by the way. This one is a little bit lower than the other. So even if you don't really know the, the nurse supply, try to think logically. Okay, if, if this one is L1 to L3, so I'm expecting that this one is going to be a little bit lower than the first. It's going to take from a level lower than this one. Okay, so this one is femoral nerve, and let's see what those nerves are. Those are the Eliosoas group. And this type of questions in the exam are going to be just like this. Just like this. This is a question in the bank. Okay, so uh, fortunately, if you are going to, to have a question, it will be just similar or typical to this question. And we are now revising what those muscles are. We have the psoas major and we have the iliacus. Both together are the iliopsoas group. Okay, forget about the origin and the insertion. I just want you to remember that both of them are responsible for flexion of the hip. It makes sense because both of them are inserted here in the trochanter of, uh, of the thigh. So when they are going to contract, where is my, my pen? Okay. Okay, here we are. When they are going to contract, they are going to move this point up. So this is flexion, flexion of the hip. And if they are going to contract from here, they are going to move the spine to the side or to the side. This is what we call epilateral flexion. Epilateral flexion. It makes sense also, okay? Sometimes they ask about the insertion. Why? Because th this is how it works, and this is how the flexion of the hip works. Again, why those muscle matters to us as obstetricians and gynecologists? Because you may, you may uh, injure the nerve supply, okay, which is the femoral nerve here, and if you injure the femoral nerve during your operation, the patient is not going to be able to flex her hip. So what will be the consequences? The consequences is going to be she cannot climb up the stair. Okay? When you climb up the stair, you, you need to flex your hip. So this is one of the most important questions, guys, which is surgery and anatomy related, both of them. 
they are not going to ask you about something that is not related to your speciality. When they do something like this, we hate this question. And they, they did it like once or twice. The question was related to general surgery. It has nothing to do with, with or obstetrics and gynecology, nothing to do with it. It, it was a surgical question related to uh, the liver anatomy, and I had no idea why, why they brought such a question. But anyway, it's only one question. Okay, only one. So it, it, it's not going to be the reason you are uh, failing or succeeding. So here, this is why we are concerned with those muscles, their nerve supply and how they work, and how when we are going to affect the femoral nerve, it's going to appear with what clinical picture. So now, if my patient, after the operation, especially if we are talking about long operation, that we need restrictors, or the patient is having a lysotomy position for a long time, like vaginal hysterectomy, for example, okay? So this is why the femoral nerve can get affected, compressed, and then the patient cannot climb the stair. She's having weakness in uh, flexing her hip. That means that the femoral nerve is affected, the iliacus is affected. Sometimes when the injury is severe, uh, we are not going to, to affect the source major, to, to, be, uh, to be honest because it, it, the nerve supply is very up high, okay? H however, if by any reason, uh, it, it, whether it was malposition during uh, the operation, on, on the oper operation table, and it, it may happen, it may happen, okay? Or for whatever reason, the nerve injury was very severe, up to the level that L1, to L3 is affected, okay? Both remise. So yeah, she, she's not going to be able at all, at all to flex, flex her, uh, her hip. Okay, let's move on. I call those questions uh, who who want to be to be the millionaire. It it feel like this, which muscle is considered as the strongest flexor of hip joint? Come on, you should be able to to answer this now. Yes, again, it's Eliosoas. It's not clear. All of you cannot see the, the screen clearly. You can zoom in, by the, by the way, Dr. Rehab, you can zoom in on your screen if you are using your phone. Zoom in uh, as you are zooming into any picture. Okay, this, this would be the iliosoas, of course. This is the strongest flexor of the hip joint. Okay, th this one I, I have answered for you. So let's have a quick revision over the ligaments that keep us upright. This is also a cool question, okay? The muscle or the ligament that help us to be upright and restrict the lateral flexion of the pelvis, of the pelvis. This would be the LU lumbar ligament. Those ligaments here are the strongest ligament that is restricting the pelvis where it is. Our pelvis only can move forward and backward. 
but the pelvis never is going to be able to do lateral flexion. Okay, so this is why, because of those ligaments, those LU lumbar ligaments. Those are the lumbosacral junction here and here. Lumbo and sacral here, the, the joint. Okay, and those ligaments are, are fixing the pelvis to the lower part of the spine, as you can see. Okay, if we have only those ligaments on one side, we would do some flexion on the other side. But because they are bilateral, so the pelvis is restricted to do the lateral flexion. As I told you, this kind of questions, you are not going to be able to cover what, however or whatever resources you are reading. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you honestly, those questions are like, uh, who wants to be the millionaire? But but they have they have a point. They have a point behind those questions, okay? Which is, it's a common question, thing that you should not miss, and you should keep in your mind because of injuries that you may be uh, or you may encounter during your practice. What is the strongest ligament of our body? Now, this is the aliofemoral. The aliofemoral ligament, by the way, uh, is the reason why when, when we have a fracture in the fever, it, it's happening here, or it's happening here in the head for old people. This ligament is very, very strong. It's going to attach the anterior superior iliac spine here to the enter through canteric crest of the femur. So you can say this is why we are having our hip joint in place. It, we, we don't have this location of hip joint easily like other joints. N not like your, uh, your knee joint or not like your elbow joint. This, this joint uh, is very, very hard to have this location. Why? Because the main idea of having a femoral ligament is to prevent hyperextension of this joint. So this one is the one that prevents us from falling when we have a standing posture. Again, this question came before, as I recalled. Yes, it's an old one, but it's it's there. It's in the bank, so it, it can appear again. And I'm telling you guys, the examiner is just doing his job. So he's going to pick one, two, three questions from the bank and add some questions to them. And that's it. And the, he's not one, by the way. He, there are many, many examiners. So again, this ligament is the one that prevents us from falling backwards when we stand up. Why? Because it prevents the hyperextension of this joint. Okay, I know I'm, I'm sounding boring until now, but, but guess what? Those are recall questions. And I have collected some key facts about the hip and thigh that you, you may have a look over them. Is going to help you, by the way. Uh, hopefully, they are going just to remind you what are the muscles of each quadrant or each joint. Okay, the LU soleus muscle is very important in the exam. So please, please try to remember the innervation, the blood supply, and the function, especially the nerve in, uh, innervation, okay? Why? Because each one of those guys can be affected during our obstetric and gynecological operation. We can hit the obturator nerve, we can hit the femoral nerve, we can hit the sciatic nerve. 
okay? So this is why they are important. Not, not because we, they are going to ask about the origin and insertion of the side compartments. And what are the muscles of side compartments? No, the question is going to come as a woman who cannot ride a horse. A woman who cannot adduct her size, a woman who cannot climb the stairs, and so on. Okay, so he wants you to know which nerve is supplying which muscle and the effect after injury, of course. Okay, hopefully we can have some interesting questions. Okay. What is the muscle responsible for supporting pelvic organs in females? You should know this. You should know it by heart. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. This would be the elevator in eye, of course. This is the muscle in the pelvic floor that supports the pelvic organ. Does this mean that it is the only one or the only component of the pelvic floor? No, we have other ligaments also. But the levator in eye is the main one. And the levator in eye muscle is composed of several muscles. Okay? So this, this muscle is supporting the uterus and it's supporting the bladder, and it's supporting the anus in its place, okay? When we have weakness in any of those muscles, according to the muscle of weakness, we can have uterine prolapse, and we can have cystocele, bladder prolapse, and we can have rectocele, right? The rectal prolapse. So let, let's revise quickly. We have here the pupococcygeus. Pupococcygeus is this one that surrounds the opening of what? It is the central one or the very near one to the center. It, it surrounds the vaginal opening, right? Okay, and then moving outside, we're going to have the LU coccygeus. From its name, I'm expecting that it extends from the alias to the coccyx, right? And we have around the anus, the pupil rectalis. Pupil rectalis is going to join the uh, perineal body in here and it's going to extend until it reaches the sensus pupus or the pubic bone. So it's going to support the rectal opening mainly. It's going to support the rectal opening mainly. The uh, pupococcygeus is going to support mainly the vaginal opening. Okay, moving outside more. Those those three are the levator in arm. Those three are the levator in arm. But we have another muscle also. We have the obturator internus, very lateral one. Okay, and this one, its blood supply can be again damaged during some gynecological operation and we have uh, backwards the pyriforms and coccygeus muscles. Coccygeus muscle is uh, the one that is very broad underneath the levator in arm. Okay this mus those muscles here guys those are the superficial muscles. Okay, as you know, we have deep muscles and superficial muscles. Superficial perineal muscles and deep perineal muscles. Those are the superficial perineal muscles. 
that is mostly encountered in episiotomy, right? So again, they are supporting also those openings, right? But the main one is, is what is the elevator in one? Here we have the uh, palpospongiosus muscle and SQ cavernosus. And of course, the perineal muscles, whether it was the deep one or the superficial one. Which one? Okay, is, this is another question, so may, maybe it will appear. Okay, here we are. By the way, this is very, very common exam question. Very common exam question. That they are going to bring you a question like this. Okay, point on one of the muscles and ask you, what is this muscle? Or what is the nerve supply of this muscle? Or what is the arterial supply of this muscle? So the one in yellow here. The one in yellow here, it's extending from the sacrum all through to the aliopectineal line. So it is the aliococcygeus by logic, by logic. Yes, yes. So, so even if I'm I'm having conflict in the exam, I'm not I'm not really sure or I have forgot. Let me think out loud, okay? So it, it is extending from the sacrum to the aliopectineal line, right? So this is the aliococcygeus. The aliococcygeus is from the superficial or the deep perineal muscle. Deep, of course, it is a part of the levator in eye, right? One of the muscles of the levator in eye. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so here we are. This question, for example, it, it is asking you about the anatomic structure involved in a mediolateral episiotomy. First of all, I'm not going to encounter any deep muscle in my episiotomy. My episiotomy should involve only superficial muscles. Right? It, it, it's not, not going to affect the deep group of, of muscles. I, I made it very easy. <laughs> okay. Yes, you are right. You are right. It is number one. Yes, so here we are again. I'm reminding you. Here we are. We have the vaginal opening here. This is the pulpo cavernosus, the one that is very near to the vaginal opening, the superficial one, of course. This is the first one is going to be encountered during my physiotomy. Then the transverse perineal muscle. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't by any means affect the external anus sphincter. This is a kind of tear, right? This is a third, third degree of perineal tear. Our episiotomy is a second degree of perineal tear. The first degree is the one that affects the, the vaginal epithelium or mucosa only. Second degree is when we affect the superficial muscles around the vaginal opening. The third degree is when you are affecting the, the sphincter, the anal sphincter, whether it's external or internal, or you have affected the anal mucosa, this is very deep injury. That, that means that you have, you have your cut not only in the sphincter, the external one, but also in the internal one, 
not only the internal one, but also inside the mucosa. So this is very deep there. Very deep there. This is the fourth degree there. Okay. 